Good evening, everyone. Do me a quick favor. Turn to the person next to you and say this. You're not here by accident, but you're here by God's design. Well, I want to thank you here. And this morning, we had over well, nearly 500 of our leadership um, team here. This all of our grace group leaders, apprentice assistants, host group facilitators in the house this morning just for a time of training and equipping. And I'm so grateful. So if you were one of those leaders that were here this morning, thank you for being part of our leadership team. And I'm so grateful that God has called you to be one of our, just a pastoral arms, as it were, to pastor and lead this church because our staff can't do it alone. And so we need each and every one of you, those who serve behind the scenes and those who are leading grace groups. And we're so grateful that you are being used by God to reach people and to equip people for the works of service. Can I hear, man? So can we give all the leaders a hand, really stretching, for, stretching forward? Also, tomorrow night, I'm excited. We are kind of in a pre-service or pre-launch gathering at times in our Kapolei campus. We are, are we're believing that God will reach people on the west side. How many people live on the west side? Come on, west side people, be proud. Come on. Yeah. So, have a beach. Have a hope. And we're so excited that we're going to be tomorrow night gathering those who are interested, those who want to serve, those who want to hear the vision and values of what we're doing to reach people and the community and families on the west side. Makakila Elementary, 6 p.m. We're going to do it for several weeks, several Sunday evenings. And then once we feel like the infrastructure and everybody's ready to go, we will open and have a grand opening and launch our services in Kapolei. But I'm going to ask that you would pray for us, that we would have a location and a home that we can call home on the west side because God has called us to, to multiply leaders and also sites and campuses. So all of you, if you're here for the very first time or you've been here for years, you all have a part to play in that, and so we are excited for that. So tell the person next to you, so you don't, so you don't fall asleep tonight, tell them you are a part of what God is doing here. Come on. Well, tonight is the eve of the 15th anniversary of 9-11, and I want to treat this word with great honor and respect, and, and, but also realize that in this moment... Um, I was telling the staff as we were preparing for this, and, and not to make light of it, but right now as we are in the service, 15 years ago, the terrorists and people who were plotting and people who did this, this deed were actually in motion already. They were making their way to the airports. They were making their way to the places where they would cause massive destruction. And so on this eve of 9-11, sometimes we tend to forget, we want to sweep it under the rug, but analysts have said and historians have said 9-11 is on the same level and par to what happened here at Pearl Harbor because it awakened the world and it was a worldwide tragic event. And I want to just go through scriptures and kind of maybe ask, answer a few questions on why tragic events like this happen. So can we pray tonight before we begin? Heavenly Father, I thank you for your presence established in worship, Lord, because you said you inhabit the praises of your people. So, Lord, we give you all the glory. We put aside, Lord God, the things of our own life, Lord, the petty things that we, Lord God, sometimes put in preeminent spots or places ahead of you. Forgive us for that. And we put you back in the rightful place of our hearts. You're upon the throne of our hearts, the ruler and the master of our lives, and I pray, Lord, tonight that the Holy Spirit would speak to everyone here, that, Lord, even as we leave this place, we would apply, Lord, that your word to our lives, that your word and the seed of your word would be deposited into our hearts, and it would bear fruit, Lord God, and as your scripture says, fruit that will remain. I thank you, Lord, for each heart, each family, Lord, each life here, that you have called them for such a time as this. Lord, we remember, Lord God, who you are, that you are above all. In Jesus' name, and we pray, and everyone said... Amen, amen. In part two of the series, we remember, even when life collapses around us, God arises. And scripture says in Genesis 11, and let me give you the backdrop of this. In our lives, there are storms that we face. We've been talking about different storms that we face. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about what we, what we shared last week and kind of develop that thought a little further today. 
But there are storms that we all face. No one is immune to storms. Everyone goes to storms. The Bible says it rains on the just and the unjust. That means it rains and there's storms that come upon people who know Christ and people who don't know Christ. And I tell you what, if we don't know Christ, when those storms come, we can easily get swamped over and inundated with the water and the pressures of life that can pull us down. But if we know Christ, He is the anchor. He is our refuge. He is the high tower when we can run to and be saved. Can I hear amen? So we pick it up here in Genesis 11, our opening volley of Scripture. We find here that now the people of God or the pe people on the earth are unified. There is only one language that pulls them all together. And it says here, now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top to the heavens and make us a name for ourselves, lest we are dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, behold, they are of one people and they have one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth and they left off building the city. God's will and God's plan and God's purpose was for man to go forth into all the earth, filling with offspring, multiply and be fruitful and also to reflect His glory. We are created to be a reflection of His glory. Can I hear amen? And that's why we are on this earth. And He even, from Adam, the first human being that He created, He told Adam to subdue and rule the earth. Even when He was chased out of the garden, the commandment was still given to Him that Adam, where, even if you were to leave this paradise, this garden of Eden, wherever you go, you were still called to rule and subdue the earth. That same covenant was translated and transmitted and, and came, brought down to Noah. When Noah was the man and his family that rescued really the human, humanity. Was when, Jesus, when God was about to bring judgment on the earth, he said, Noah, take your family, your sons, your daughters-in-law, and, and, and go to the ark and you shall be saved. And the co covenant that the Lord gave to Noah was to be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. So here the covenant... Before even Abraham came on the scene, the covenant from the heart of the Lord was for the people to go throughout the earth, multiply, be fruitful, increase in number. But we find here that the people got comfortable. And they settled. How many of you sometimes life is so good? It's just so much easier to just to settle in one place. Because you don't want your boat to be rocky. You don't want your life to be up and down. Sometimes you just want to settle just chill, calm down, get the Mai Tai out, get the cigar out, just go to the ocean and just enjoy the sunset. How many think life would be grand if we could just do that? Oh, a few people are nodding. <laughs> but we recognize that life is not like that. That life is not like that. And when we settle and when we allow just the ease and the comfort of life to overtake us, we can easily get off of mission. We can easily get off the purpose of what God created us to be. So in disobedience, man stayed. And they settled there in the plain. And they felt comfortable. And pretty soon in that place of comfortability, that's not a word, but because it sounded so good, it's now a word for tonight. My wife says, I always say that word. There's no such word in the dictionary. Google it, you won't find it. But because it sounds so nice and has a lot of syllables, it must be a great word. But when we get comfortable in life, and the people of God were comfortable in life, they said, you know what? It's time to settle. We don't need to spread out anymore. If we keep on going, we're going to have to face more enemies, get into more battles, and, and we just, just stay right here. It's so comfortable. It's the sun is shining. There's no, there's no storms in life. And it's pretty soon, instead of marching forward into the purpose that God had, into the promises that God said for you to be fruitful, increase in number, go out and subdue and rule the earth, the people settled. And in that settling, they said, well, now it's time. We're comfortable. 
Let's make a name for ourselves. Let's put together this monument, this tower. Let's start to build out the city and in the middle of the city. Let's put a tower right there and we'll build it so high that we can ascend up to the heavens and be, as it were, like God. And pretty soon, God said, let's take a look at what's going down on earth. And it's funny, it's interesting. God said, let us. Now, I don't know if, where, where, where you stand theologically, if, it was, if he was talking to Jesus and the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, or if he was talking to the host of angels there. But he said, hey, guys, let's just peer down in, onto the earth from the heavens, and let's look at what's happening there. And I'm sure God was talking to the angels and the host of heaven, saying, didn't I... Didn't I give a command to the people to be fruitful, to increase? Didn't I say to go out through the earth and increase in number? Didn't I say that, guys? Was I wrong? And so he looked from heaven, the angels and all of the hosts of heaven was looking down upon what the, what the humans were doing. There, were being, there was unity. And he said, if the man and the hearts of mankind can come together in unity, nothing would be impossible for them. Not that they would be greater than God. He knew that. But he knew when they would come together in unity, anything that they put their hands to, they would overcome and be victorious. And they would increase in number in one place. And the Lord said, it's time. It's time to bring a storm. And because of their disobedience, the storm that they faced was a storm that they created. It was a storm that they created. And in that storm, God brought a storm of confusion to scatter them and brought to them a place of, of, of new languages, new territories, only because he knew that if the people settled, if the people got too comfortable in that place, they would miss the purposes, and they would miss the destiny of God in their life. How many of us, if I were to ask that same question tonight, tonight say, man, my life is so comfortable, Lord. I don't want any storms. I, I, I don't want anything wrong to go on in my life. Lord, can I just be comfortable? The Lord says, no, I'm sorry. Life is not like that. Life is not like that. Because once we get too comfortable, guess what? God is replaced out of our lives. Our, it all becomes about us. The unholy trinity, as Pastor Coach says every time, it becomes about me, myself, and I. Instead of the purposes of God in our life. God had to trigger a storm, a confusion, to bring a realignment back to his will. God allowed the storm to come, but it was brought on by the people. They brought on, because of their disobedience, they brought on this storm that God allowed in their life. And how many of us have created our own storms in our own life because of bad decisions, because maybe disobedience, maybe patterns of sin in our life? Sometimes we, we do things and we step out of the will of God because we think our will and our way is better. And when, when we do that, guess what? We're going to start on the horizon. There will, there will be a brewing of a storm coming. But that storm comes because of our doing, because of our disobedience, because of walking away from the purpose and the plan and the will of God. But not only do we create storms, there are storms that the enemy sends to us. In Luke chapter 8, verse 22, we talked about the same parallel passage in Matthew 11 last week. If you were here last week, if you weren't, please go online and listen to part one of the series, the opening volley of this series, God over all. But we, pay, we are taking now the par parallel passage in Luke, verse 22. It says, one day he got into the boat with his disciples and he said to them, let us go across to the other side of the lake. They just came out of a heavy season of ministry. They saw Jesus preach to the multitude. They saw Jesus heal the sick. They saw Jesus cast out demons. And now Jesus said, it's time to go across to the other side to have a time of reflection, to have a time of processing, to have a time of refreshing. And so they set out, and as they sailed, he fell asleep. And a windstorm came down on the lake, and they were filling with water and were in danger. How many of you ever, ever been on a boat out on the sea where they're fishing? And all of a sudden, your boat started to have a leak. And then they wrap. Okay, we have good fishermen here. I tell my story. I went out with my friends one time. There were six of us on a 13-footer. Bad idea. Okay, that thing was so small. Two of us would have sank that boat. But there were six of us trying to go out there on the, on the, on the uh, Wainai Harbor. And we set out on this boat. Six of us. And trust me, I was the lightest one in that boat. <laughs> nah, I may not have been. 
maybe in my eyes I was the lightest and so we set out on this boat and in 15 20 minutes our boat started taking in water because we we're too heavy six of us on this 13 foot boat not a great idea and I started to get seasick and it was a bad experience so because of that don't ever ask me to go fishing with you ever on the boat fishermen I will say I will gladly say I'm sorry I'll pass but here the disciples were seasoned fishermen they weren't afraid of the storms but now a great storm is coming ahead of them before them around them and they were afraid and Jesus was asleep and they went and woke him saying master master we are perishing and he awoke and rebuked the wind and the raging waves and they ceased and there was a calm he said to them where is your faith and they were afraid and yet through that they marveled we not recognize and we believe that this storm was demonically sent this is a storm that the enemy was using to take out the disciples he was seeing what Jesus was doing in their life discipling and training and equipping them he saw the power of, of Jesus being activated and now the disciples were in his presence learning and growing in their faith and so before the gospel could be spread any further the enemy brought on this storm to take them out to kill them as the Bible says his mission on this earth is to steal kill and destroy you if he can't delay the promises of God in your life he'll try to distract you from the promises of God in your life and if he can't delay you and distract you he will destroy you and in this moment the enemy was trying to destroy the lives of the disciples scripture says that we have a measure of faith and in this moment guess what Jesus renounced the storm he rebuked the storm he didn't just say storm be silent wind be silent winds calm down he actually talked to the storm this squall and actually rebuke the storm to be calm and many of us in our lives sometimes we think the storms that, that are coming around the horizon we, we kind of take it lightly in our lives well Lord if it's your will if your, your sovereignty it works in my life and I know every saint has to go through a storm so I'll just kind of ride this storm out sometimes that storm that you're facing in your life could be a demonic storm that's sent to destroy you and you may not be, be aware of that and here Jesus was setting an example to the disciples there are storms that come against our life storms that you bring even storms that I may allow to develop faith in me but there are storms that sometimes the enemy sends against you and when those storms come against you use that measure of faith that I place in your life whether it's a mustard seed faith or whether it is a large faith that's been built and developed over time because of trials and testings in your life but use that faith call out to me and when you call out to me I will be there but first I'm asking you to take that action step and stand firm in the midst of storms not just run sometimes when the storms come we tend to run oh pastor Camille help me I got this storm pastor Key where are you pray for me no sometimes when people come to me and say pastor can you pray for me I got this storm sometimes I really honestly want to say no shocking I want you to pray first I want you to stand in faith first. I want to use the measure of faith that's within you and draw that out. And when you stand, and if you're standing and you can't stand anymore, then I'll come alongside of you and gird you up in faith and stand together in the storm. But sometimes when the storms come, we're like, we're like, the, we're like the disciples, Lord, are you trying to kill us? Jesus says, no. I want you to stand. Here's my example. Storm cease and desist enemy get your hands off my kids get off my life this cancer that that's been that's the doctor said is in my in my life break that in the name of jesus there's something inside of you sometimes we, we come on in hawaii we we, we kind of just lay down and let the wind blow and the sun shine we're like okay whatever whatever no don't take whatever when the enemy rises up against you the bible says to stand stand firm on his word stand firm on his promises and there are some things in your life that yet have to be broken because God is saying can you stand I want to work I want to heal I want to provide I want to move in your life but first I'm asking you saints can you stand Woo, baby I'm just warming up can you stand 
Can you stand in faith? Can you believe? Can you thank me? That's why pastor come in and the worship team are saying, can you thank the Lord? Thank the Lord before you even get the miracle, before you even get the provision. Thank him for that in advance. And I tell you what, something happens when you start to confess the word of God in your life, out of your mouth. It changes the atmosphere in, in your life. And for some of you, when you start to do that, yes, you might have a mustard seed of faith. But when you start to stand firm on the promises of God, on his word, your faith grows. And pretty soon, you're going to look like Anthony. Baby, that's one big mountain of faith. <laughs> My brother is sitting right here, so I pick on him. But that's how, it, that's how our faith grows and Jesus was sending an example for the disciples. Do not be afraid. Use that inner faith that you have and stand and rebuke the storms in your life. Rebuke it. Because I have given you all the authority to heal the sick. Jesus said that. I've given you all the authority to heal the sick. I've given you all the authority to cast out demons. But will you activate that faith that I have deposited into your life, in your daily life? Can I hear Amen. In this particular storm of 9-11, my belief is that this was a perfect storm, a storm that was created, that we brought upon ourselves, and a storm that was demonically sent. America, the great nation that we are, sometimes we rest on our laurels of financial success, of the freedoms that we sometimes take for granted. And then sometimes we, we, when the sun sh is shining and, and, and things are, are, are grand, sometimes we just, it, it, it feels so good, it's okay. But underneath all of that, in our complacency, in our turning to ourselves, in the uh, American dream, as it were, it's for you to be a success where it's all about you, yourself, and your own desires, and your own platform, and your own, your own portfolio, and your own family, and your own fame. We got away from how this nation was built. This nation was built on biblical principles, a nation on religious freedoms to pull themselves away from the Church of England and, and, and be able to come to a new land where they could have the free expression to worship God. And the Constitution, if you look at it, was built on biblical practices and, and the foundations of Scripture. But look where we are at now. In 2016, we have swayed so far and I look at the upcoming elections. We're going to talk about this a little bit more next week. I look at the upcoming elections. I was kind of watching some of the barrage of, of Hillary versus Trump. And it's ridiculous. I want to sometimes just throw up. It's bad. It's nasty. And I'm looking, Lord, that's who's going to lead our country the next four years? You know what that causes me to do? To drop on my knees and pray. To drop on my knees and pray because, Lord, forgive us as a nation where we have strayed so far away, where we have gotten so comfortable and it becomes all about ourselves and our family and our own desires and our own things in life. The things that the, the Bible says will burn away when Jesus comes. And we build all, we build everything and we pour everything into the temporal things in this life. And when that storm of 9-11 came, Yes, part of it is it was of our own doing. Because we got complacent and the church got complacent. Where we have stopped reaching out. Where we have gotten, as it were, almost like the world. The Bible says be in the world but not of the world. And we forgot what it is to express the gospel of Jesus Christ around us, to deposit love to people around us. And when 9-11 hit, guess what? Churches around the world, and especially in America, tripled in number. Tripled in number for several weeks and months. But guess what happened about five to six months after 9-11 happened? Churches emptied out again. People forgot about who God was in their life. And they got back to the pl place of being at ease and living in a place of comfortability. <laughs> I hope that you're not here like that. I know you're not. But I just want to be, bring us to a place of remembering. Remembering. And the enemy just jumped on that. It's like a perfect storm converging together. 
the storm that we brought upon ourselves because we put our trust in the almighty dollar instead of God himself, where we stopped sharing our faith with people and we got, it's all been about ourselves, the church. That's the church. And the enemy jumped right on top of that and said, well, let me bring a storm to bring the church to its knees, to bring this nation to its knees. The great Billy Graham said it best. He called it a spiritual attack which requires a spiritual response, which requires a spiritual response. Scripture says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, not, probably not in your notes, but it says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. We can't fight this on the natural pain. I'm so glad for a military community that does this. And they protect our freedoms in the natural. But the church's job is not to just leave it to the military community. That's a great time to say amen. We go hand in hand with the military men and women who are laying their lives down to protecting our freedom, who answered the call to defend this nation and the flag and the Constitution. But the church comes along right side of it, not downplaying the military at all, not throwing stones at the military, not having a political, a political protest against the military. No, I'm so grateful for our men and women who serve and who have served. But the church comes alongside. The church is also an army. Yes, we are a family, but we are a spiritual army. If you don't realize that, get into one of our classes so we can, we can teach you what it means to be a church. The church is not just a hospital. It's not just a family. But the church is an army. The Bible says the gates of hell will not prevail against you. You are the church. Turn to the person next to you. You are the church. Sound a little bit more convincing. Say, you are the church. The gates of hell will not prevent, prevail against you. That means that you are in a spiritual battle. You are in a fight against the enemy that wants to steal, kill, and destroy you. And the only way that we can defend, the only way that we can defend and fight is with, through the word of God, through reaching out, through extending ourselves to people who don't know Christ and taking them from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Expanding the kingdom of God on this earth. That is our job as Christians. That is our job as the church. And the only way to stem the tide of the enemy's attack is to get on the attack as well. To take this faith that we have and move it forward with sharing the gospel. The question to you tonight is, have you shared your faith with somebody this year? We challenged 500 leaders this morning that we would get back onto mission. Each one reach one this year. Each one reach one this year. And the question tonight is, on this eve of 9-11, have we, have we done that? One time, at least one time this year, shared the gospel, shared your faith. Pray for someone to come to Christ. The best place, I, I, I always say this, the best place for people to get saved is not here. Yes, I love the hands that respond. Yes, that's great. But the best place for people to respond to their faith is when you're sitting in front of them, over the dinner table, over coffee, at the park, at a restaurant, at a family gathering, and just sharing your faith and, and saying, this is what God can do. He changed my life. He can change yours. He's a God that loves you. And when you share the gospel, see them come to a place of faith. That's the best. I rejoice more in those moments than people raising their hand here. Yes, I'm glad for people raising their hand at one of our 14 services. But I rejoice more. I rejoice more when you step out in faith. You take the kingdom of God and expand it and enlarge it and move forward by your faith. Can I hear an amen tonight? Can I hear a stronger amen? amen? Then finally, not only is the storm that we bring upon ourselves, not only is there demonic storms that the enemy tries to steal, kill, and destroy you, but there are the storms that God uses. There are storms that God uses. Again, we find the disciples out on the lake, out on the sea again. This time, 
after a time of heavy ministry, after a time of, 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 of healing again the, the sick, doing miracles, casting out demons, they actually came out of a time of feeding the 5,000 people that were gathered there listening to a message like this. And 5,000 people were, were able to eat because God multiplied the bread and the fishes. And so now Jesus said, why don't you disciples get in the boat and go across the sea while I go away and pray and spend time with my father. And so the disciples went out by themselves again, fishermen. They know the sea. They know what it is to be in storms. They know what it is to navigate the waters and the currents. But it says here in Matthew chapter 14, verse 23, when evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land. This is Jesus. And the boat was beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost! But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Then Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, walked on the water, and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. It began to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. This storm was different. This storm was different. It's called actually an epiphany. A epiphany. It's an intentional spiritual manifestation in natural, natural eyes to see. And it was meant to teach a spiritual lesson. And this storm that was brewing, and as Jesus commanded the storm, and, and as Jesus was walking on, on the ocean, and as he was encountering Peter and said, Peter, come, come, follow me. Step out into the water. Trust in me. Put your eyes on me. Fix your eyes on me. And you'll be able to walk on water. And for a moment, Peter did. He gazed at Jesus. And he was walking on the sea upon water. No man has ever done this before. But pretty soon, instead of keeping his eyes on Christ, he started to look at the situation around him, at the wind, at the waves. And pretty soon, his faith started to lower. And he started to lose heart. And he forgot who it was that was beckoning him to come, beckoning and calling him. He forgot it was Jesus, the Son of God, the person who he just saw multiply the fishes, multiply the bread. And in the moment of a lack of faith, he started to drown. But Jesus used this. He used this storm to teach a lesson that we must look for God, look for the Lord in the storm, He's always there. In the storm that you are facing right now, He is there. He is there. But your mission is to fix your eyes on Him and not the situation. Stay focused on Him throughout the storm, and He will take us through the storm. You guys caught that? Realize the storm that you are facing, that Jesus is in the storm. And as you stay focused on Him throughout the storm, He will take us through the storm. Jesus is there for you. The question that many people ask, where was God in the 9-11 storm? Where was God? Where is God even in my own personal storm? I remember 15 years ago in Hawaii, it was probably what, 3.34, 4.30 in the morning at that time, I believe, and my phone was going off, and, and I was in a deep sleep, I probably was thinking about the NFL season and how my Dallas Cowboy, Cowboy fantasy football lineup was going to be the next morning. It was, and then, no, I wasn't. I was just, I was snoring away. And my phone was going off. It was like nonstop. It was vibrating and going off. Usually, I, I don't have it off. I just have it on vibrate, but I had, had the ringer on in the old school phone, the flip phone. Remember those flip phones? <laughs> All the young guys are like, flip phones? Wow. Is that a new model? Okay. It was one of the flip phones, and it was going off and vibrating on my, on my dresser desk next to me. And finally, I pick it up, and it was one of our young adult worship leaders. He said, hey, Pastor Paris, are you awake? I said, yes, now I am. 
<laughs> what's up? And she said, you better turn on the TV right now because something is happening in New York City. Something is happening at, at, the, at the Pentagon. Something is going on. And, it, it, and she sounded very afraid. So I, I got up and went to the TV. And, we, and all of you, you know where you were. You know what you were doing at that moment. And then I was glued to the TV for hours, praying, grieved, wondering what was going on as many of you were thinking the same thing. Like, what the heck is going on? And I realized this, that there are some scriptures that came to my mind out of Psalms 18, verse 2 and 3. It says this, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God, my strength in whom I will trust, the horn of my salvation and my high tower. I will call upon the Lord, so shall I be saved from my enemies. And when the towers went down and the things that happened at the Pentagon and things that Flight 93, that some men had the courage to take, that, to take the terrorists down in that plane and sacrifice themselves. We realized that in this moment, life changed. In the moment, life changed. A storm came, not only against the U.S., but the entire world. It changed the landscape of history in a moment. And in a moment, I wondered where we were as a church. I wonder if we just were callous and said, well... It's not my, I'm not affected. I don't know anybody. It's not my deal. Whatever. I hope that wasn't our attitude. For some of you, you were affected because you had family who lost their lives there. We had people who were in relationship with people who knew and had family, Pearl Side family in those towers. And I realized that in the moment, history changed. And in the moment, the outlook of life changed for many people and thousands of people around the world. And the question that resounded in everybody's hearts, where was God on 9-11? I'm answered to you is he was there. He was there. He was present even in that storm. He was there. And coming out of that storm, our response, knowing that it was a spiritual attack, is to go on the spiritual offensive to take the gospel of Jesus Christ out to people so that when the storms of life come against them, they'll be able to withstand their own storm. And as a nation, as we come to elections, and we know the landscape of the Supreme Court is about to change, and we know a new president will be in power for at least for the next four years, our response should be a heart of prayer. A heart of prayer that says, Lord, I'm not going to pray, pray, and pray throw stones against them. I'm just going to pray that, Lord God, you move upon whoever's heart will be president. If it's Hillary or if it's Trump, whoever it is, Lord, that you move upon their heart. And I pray for their salvation. I pray for their life, for some people around them to come alongside and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not, not, just, not just to pull the votes of evangelicals. <laughs> no. But someone to come alongside of our leaders in the Supreme Court, in, in, in Congress, in, here in Hawaii, our leaders, and someone would share their faith to them that they would become disciples. Can I hear amen? amen? Scripture in Isaiah 43, verse 1 and 2 says, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the waters of trials, of testing, I will be with you. And through the rivers, and they shall not overwhelm you. God is there with you in the midst of your storm. And final scripture, Isaiah 46, verse 1, realize that God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. My encouragement to you today is whether you're facing a storm or about to face a storm, all of us will face a storm. If you're not in one now, you will be in one soon. That your first response, your first response will be to the Lord. Lord, I turn to you. I run to you. You are my high tower. You're my refuge. You're the source of my strength. You're the source of my provision. Lord, I put you back in the preeminent spot in the priority of my life. And Lord, this storm might be a storm that's redirecting me back to you. Lord, I thank you, Lord, for redirecting me back to you. That should be our heart's response. In 911 emergencies, present help is always ready, but we must make the call. Yes, God knows our heart. But when the storms of life press you in, make the call. Pick up the hotline to heaven and say, Father God, I need you. 
Father God, help me. Be with me through this storm. Help me to learn the lessons of this storm. I realize this, that God is always ready and ever-present, waiting for us to call on him. He's waiting for us. Some people, when they were in that tower, you hear the countless stories of people calling out to the Lord. Some lost their lives. Many people lost their lives. Thousands lost their lives. And thousands have lost their lives in the different battles and arenas that we, we are in, in different theaters and different arenas of battle. But my question is always, I wonder, Lord, if they had an opportunity. Someone came alongside of them and shared the gospel to them. I wonder, Lord, if they had an opportunity to, to at least have at this time a decision to say, yes, I choose you. I wonder. I wonder. And in our lives, I wonder about the people around us that are going through their own storms of life. And I'm wondering that we're able to extend ourselves and say, there is a God that is your refuge, that is your strength, that is your portion. Turn to him. He is there. On this movie, World Trade Center, made by Oliver Stone, it depicts the story of two Port Authority officers, John McLaughlin and Will Jimeno, and their fellow officers who head into the towers as it was going down. As the South Tower crashes down, they run into the elevator shaft of the North Tower without much hope to cling on because now they were buried under all the rubble as the North Tower started to collapse. Two Marines, Dave Carnes and Jason Thomas, feel the call of God and answer the call to go and search and help in any way possible. What a moment. Two men answering the call of God, feeling the need to go back and to see if they could be used in any way possible. And these two Port Authority officers, it's true life, you can read their account, you can read their their story. In the midst of knowing that their life may be in peril, went in to save people, to rescue people, and being buried under all that rubble and debris. And in the moment, their lives were saved because two guys answered the call. They answered the call, and other guys came and answered the call and said, here I am, use me. And I wonder in life, as we, the communion elements are passed tonight, as we come to the table of the Lord tonight, that for some of us, we have gotten too comfortable in life. And God is calling us back to a place of remembering that I've called you for such a time as this. I've put you in relationships with people around you who have not yet heard the gospel, have felt my love, and I'm, I'm calling upon you to be, as it were, the rescuer of their soul, to restore them back into a relationship with me as I sacrifice my life upon the cross for all of humanity. Will my sons and daughters who call me Lord and Master, do the same for others around them? Or has life gotten too comfortable, too at ease? Or you might feel right now that you are feeling the assault of the enemy against your life. And he's calling upon you that to use that faith that's been deposited into your life and to make that stand, stand of faith. A stand of faith that might, you might lose your reputation. You might lose relationships around you, but to take that stand of faith and not let the enemy overtake you, but stand firm in the faith, to call upon him that he is your strong tower, he is your high tower, he is your refuge, and he gives you the strength to overcome, not to be overcome. Or you might be in a place where you know the storm that you're facing now is God's allowing that storm to redirect you back to him. I want to pray that we would never forget his sacrifice, first of all, that he died for us. He sacrificed it all for us, and he loves us so much. He loves you. He loves you. When he died on that cross, he died for you. He saw your face. He saw your life. He saw all the millions and billions of people played out 
from the beginning of time to the end of time. He, he sees it all. He sees time in a different way than we see it. And he says, I'm, I am dying for everyone. If they would come to me, if they would come to me. Thanks for joining us. Visit our website at pearlside.org for more.